Hi everyone, this is Dr. Seher from Dentabest, uh, your best mentor. Um, today I'm with pharmacology review and we know pharmac is a very important subject but a difficult subject for most of the students. So we'll try to make it as easy as comprehensive uh, in this explanation. So this is the table of contents that we are going to study about antibiotic prophylaxis, antibiotic classes, adrenergic drug, anti-adrenergic, cholinergic, anti-cholinergic, nicotine receptor antagonist, drug administration, drought and metabolism, anesthetics, nitrous, anti-anxiety, antidepressant, antipsychotic, antihistaminic, anti-convulsant, anti-diabetic or oral hypoglycemic, antifungal and protozoal, antiviral, anesthetics, astaminophen, opioid, cancer drugs, hypoglycemic and agonist and antagonist. Okay, so firstly we start with the antibiotic prophylaxis guideline. If you can see, this is the latest 2021 EHA statement. So you should remember the list of the conditions that require antibiotic prophylaxis and that do not require the antibiotic prophylaxis. So high risk are definitely the patient with the ball processes, with have previous episode of infective endocarditis, and the dental procedure which is requiring the manipulation uh, in the blood, like surgeries, dental extraction, periodontal surgery or scaling, your dental implants, episectomies, subgingival placement of antibiotic fibers, or prophylactic cleaning of the teeth where bleeding is anticipated. But the procedure that do not involve the blood, like general restorations, uh, the normal blocks or injections, Infiltrations will not require antibiotic prophylaxis, but where you have uh, involvement of the blood, for example, when you give the injection directly into the sulcus or the PDL, it will require antibiotic prophylaxis. Placement of orthodontic bands, appliances, taking impression, radiographs, shedding of primary teeth, okay, they do not require antibiotic prophylaxis. And you can see the major change here is clindamycin is no longer the drug of choice for penicillin allergic patient because of the problem of pseudomavirinous colitis from clinda which induces the overgrowth of Clostridium difficile bacteria. So that's the reason we are using cephalosporin now as a drug of choice for penicillin allergic patient and second drug of choice are the macrolides azithromycin or clarithromycin and third drug is doxycycline. But if your patient has immediate hypersensitivity or allergy to Penicillin, you can never use cephalosporin either. But most of the cases of allergy to penicillin are delayed hypersensitivity like a rash. That's the reason cephalosporin can still be used. But immediate allergy or anaphylaxis reaction from penicillin, you cannot use cephalosporin because cephalosporin and penicillin, they share a common molecular structure. Now this is the table of all the antibiotic classes that you can see and their mechanism of action. We can see which one are inhibiting the protein synthesis, which are attacking the 30s, 50s ribosome of the bacteria, while the penicillin, they inhibit the cell wall synthesis of the bacteria, while sulfadiazine inhibit folic acid production, so DNA is not formed. So there are different mechanisms. You have to memorize this entire quick table that is given here. And below there are some agents like anticoagulant, like heparin is important in this list, or the warfarin, while antiplatelet, the important one we should know is aspirin, clopidogrel, dipyramidol. NOAs are not that important, but NSAIDs, we should know all of them because they are important. SNRI are selective norepinephrine inhibitors, like venlafaxine or FXOR is important here, and selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, like acetylopram, floxatine, they are important here. Now this is called as DEA drug scheduling. So as per the addictive potential or habituation of the drug, we have different schedule of the drug here. So schedule one has the highest abuse potential drugs like heroin, marijuana, lysergic acid, LSD. While the schedule two drugs, they have higher potential for abuse, but less than schedule one. So you have to remember what all drugs comes under every schedule. That's given very uh, nicely here. So combination product with less than 50 milligram of hydrocodone, cocaine, mephetamine, methadone, hydromorphone, meperidine, fentanyl, adiral come under schedule 2. 
Schedule 3 have a moderate abuse liability, lower than Schedule 2 and 1, like ketamine, testosterone, and all the preparation with less than 90 mg of codeine, like Tylenol 3, which has 30 mg of codeine in it. That come under Schedule 3. Schedule 4, very low risk of abuse and dependence, like Xanax, your benzodiazepine, Valium, Tremadol, Soma, they come under Schedule 4. Schedule 5 are least abuse potential among all the schedules. With the preparation less than 200 mg of codeine, less than 20 mg of codeine, sorry, per 100 ml, like in cough syrup preparation. Lomotil, Larica, they are also come under Schedule 5. So that's a very nice table here that you can go through it. Now in the cholinergic drugs, we have cholinergic agonist and antagonist just like adrenergic, directly acting through the receptor and indirectly acting. Indirectly acting, we have the reversible one like FISO, neostigmine, while the irreversible one are like organophosphate gases. Now antagonist that will block the cholinergic effect, oetropine, scopolamine, glycopyrrolate, mecamelamine, trimethophan, they are important one. The drugs which come under neuromuscular blocking drugs, the one which are non-depolarizing like tubocorare and one which is depolarizing like succinylcholine. So anticholinergic drug effects we can see on ophthalmic use, antispasmodic action, bronchodilatation, they are all anticholinergic effect. Treatment of Parkinsonism. Now this is a classification of the antidepressant drugs which are starting with the MAU inhibitors then the SSRI which is the most popular group that will only block serotonin receptor. Then you have eight typical antidepressant like bupropion is one of them. Now the tricyclic antidepressant is divided into the one which has norepinephrine and serotonin reuptake inhibitor like amitriptyline, doxepin. One which predominantly inhibit norepinephrine reuptake. So norepinephrine reuptake inhibited means norepinephrine, serotonin, they remain in your blood for a longer period of time and they cause excitation and treat your depression. But the problem with the antidepressant is when they increase the epi level or norepi level in the blood, it can lead to hypertensive attack if you are giving them epi in the local anesthesia or any other form. So the drugs like SNRI or SSRI, which are only selective for serotonin, they only prevent the serotonin reuptake. So only serotonin levels are increased in the blood, not epi level. So these drugs are better tolerated by the patient who have hypertension or giving epi in the local anesthesia because it's not increasing the epi levels, only increasing the serotonin levels. So serotonin and non adrenaline reuptake inhibitor, that is your SNRI. This is a good table of advantage and disadvantage of routes of administration like with oral route, inhalation, rectal, intravenous. So mainly you should remember the oral route is least effective route, although it's very safe, patient can use them themselves. It doesn't immediately act around 30 minutes for it to act. Oral route, you have a first pass effect through the liver. The liver is breaking down most of the drug when it's passing through it first. Very less portion will come back into the blood and go to the target site for distribution. So the oral route, the drug is going two times through the liver. The second time it goes through the liver, once it is acted on target site, come back into the blood, the unused portion, that goes into the liver again. Now the drug will go to phase two formation or conjugation when the drug converts to when the drug converts to gluconide derivative that become water soluble and then transported to kidney for excretion. But with the IM or IV route, the drug goes to the liver only once. So chances of first pass bypass effect of liver is not there. So that's the reason with the IV route also you have 100% bioavailability of the drug. That means as much drug you give to the patient, the same drug goes into his system, which is not there with the oral route. Inhalation route, it works very quick, but still the fastest route of IV of drug administration is still the IV route. Inhalation route will also bypass the liver. Rectal route will also bypass the liver just like your IV route. IV route is very good for in cases of emergency. It rapidly act but toxicity it will be lethal. You can go through the other routes too. 
Now, nitrous oxide, as we know, it's a very, very important topic of exam. We always have questions on the nitrous. So, how the nitrous is being administered to the patient that you can go through it. And signs and symptoms of ideal nitrous oxidation that start with the tingling of the hand and feet. Feeling warm, to relax body. But over sedation, patient can become irritated, not able to communicate, he'll become sleepy, hallucination, nausea, and vomiting. So children with mild anxiety, short attention span, apprehensive children, nitrous oxide is a very good drug to calm them down. But there are some contraindications, the absolute and the relative contraindication. Like first trimester pregnancy, it can lead to abortion, pulmonary hypertension. But absolute contraindication when you cannot give nitrous at all like emphysema, pneumothorax, air embolus. Advantage and disadvantage of the nitrous oxide, painless delivery, orderless, tasteless, rapid onset. Young children you can always use it, produce sedation, amnesia. But always fail safe mechanism is required so that you don't give more than 80% or less than 20% oxygen to the patient. Definitely requires the patient cooperation. So in adult, we go as high as 80-20. Usually we use the dose of 60-40 or 70-30. Means 60 nitrous and 40 oxygen or 70-30. 80-20 go maximum to maximum. Now the hypoglycemic drugs, you can see they're divided into uh, three groups. The drug which enhance the insulin secretion or the drugs which overcome the insulin resistance or which is the miscellaneous group. So metformin and pioglutazone, they will overcome the insulin resistance to the tissues. That what happens in type 2 diabetes, you become more resistant to insulin action. Some of the drug are increasing the insulin secretion like sulfonylurea group like tolbutamil, glipizide or repaglinide. Some of the drug which are miscellaneous like A-carbos, miglitol, These are different types of insulin profiles. So the uncontrolled diabetes type 2 that's not responding to hypoglycemic or insulin dependent type 1 diabetes that is seen more in the children. So insulin is the only drug for them. So you can see the one which are rapid acting, short acting, intermediate acting or long acting. So you can go through this table as well. Important drugs. Now we have the NSAIDs on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in which you have non-selective COX inhibitor that block both COX-1 and COX-2, reducing your inflammation, reducing your prostaglandin synthesis. Some of the drugs are selective COX inhibitor like salicoxib, reficoxib. So you can see different categories here. The one which comes under salicylate group is the aspirin. Ibuprofen, naproxen, they come under propionic acid derivative. Then we have mephinemic acid, pyroxicam, Ketorolac, indomethazine, acetic acid derivative. The drugs which have poor anti-inflammatory effect like your Tylenol or Paracetamol. That's a different class. Now what are the contraindications to aspirin therapy? That's also important. So patients who have active peptic ulcer, allergy to aspirin, bleeding disorder, recent GI bleeding, severe liver disease, kidney failure, thrombocytopenia, you cannot give the aspirin. Also, relative contraindication is children or adults younger than 12 years. It can develop Ray syndrome in them. Patient who is already using NSAID drug or already using anticoagulant therapy, it can increase the chance of bleeding because aspirin block TXA2 enzyme. So platelets will not aggregate and it will lead to bleeding. Now, Parkinson's disease, as we know, decreased dopamine in the blood. So, characteristic of Parkinson's, musculoskeletal changes, neuropathic, central changes, arthritis, myalgia, restriction, numbness, tingling, restlessness, prolonged involuntary muscle contraction, rigid. Treatment, more B inhibitor, salagiline, but liver dopa and dopamine combination that is called a cinnamit. That's the drug most popular. Because giving liver dopa and dopamine, uh, carbidopa together, carbidopa will decrease the breakdown of liver dopa outside blood-brain barrier. So enough liver dopa can enter inside the brain and create the action. 
There are some dopamine agonist drug that are also used or COMT inhibitor or anticholinergic like benztropine. Hi my dear students who are preparing for IMDD ADAT a part 2 exam. Uh, thanks so much for watching this preview video of the subject. If you really liked it, please buy the full version by clicking on the link given in the description. With the purchase of every video, you will be getting free live assessment and evaluations on the subject as well. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Dentabest channel now to get the latest updates on the smart videos. If you have any questions, please comment me in the box below. I, Dr. Seher from Dentavest, wishes you all the best for exam and thanks again for watching.